Okay. Well, Jim, Chris, um, thank you very much for the introduction, and um, thank you to everyone at Horse SA for the invitation to join you this morning. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, take part in the meeting, albeit in a, a in a virtual uh, way. So my brief for the next 30 minutes is to think about some of the considerations for emergency transport of large animal patients. And in this presentation, I'm going to think about some of the things we need to think about to do with the uh, animal and some of the things we need to think about to do with the transport that we're thinking uh, of using. And I thought we could start with some uh, golden rules. And I'll finish with this slide too, but these would really be my take-home messages from this presentation. So firstly, uh, for vets and the animal rescue specialists re responsible for making decisions on the casualty, don't rush into making critical decisions. If in doubt, always choose to transport and then make a decision on treatment rather than euthanizing at the scene. Not all dramatic injuries are serious, and also, as I'll show you, some injuries which are apparently not very serious uh, can actually turn out to have uh, uh, life-threatening consequences. Don't rush to transport the animal. Stabilize them first, and only transport when they are fit to travel. Ensure the vehicle is suitable. Make sure that the destination where the animal is going to is ready and prepared. They know the uh, animal is coming, and that everyone involved knows what to do. And I think above all else, never compromise animal welfare or the safety of personnel when transporting injured animals. So let's start by thinking about uh, triage of injured animals uh, ahead of transport. And triage is an essential priority at all in incidents, but can actually be quite difficult. Quite often when animals are trapped, it's difficult to get uh, adequate access to do a clinical exam. A lot of the animal may be buried in mud or under water, for example, or may be hidden behind uh, metalwork and partitions from a uh, wrecked uh, trailer or truck. Safe access to the casualty may be a real issue, and that's true in both road traffic collisions and also in situations out in the field. The temperament of the casualty might limit uh, access to. The last thing we want to do is to wind the animal up and risk further injury in trying to triage it. And I think what's really tough is that some of those really serious injuries which actually make the animal non-viable or may compromise its viability may not be at all obvious when the animal is trapped because you can't really see it very well or even after release because the injury may not be particularly visible. And the other challenge is that there are some animals which actually are not seriously injured, but which may appear to be uh, non-viable temporarily, perhaps because they're completely exhausted and hypothermic and unable to stand. And it may be difficult to differentiate those in, in the immediate incident from animals with spinal or uh, other nervous system in injuries. Uh, but despite all these challenges, early identification and correct identification of those non-viable casualties which uh, are better euthanized is really important right at the start of the instant. It's important for welfare. The last thing we want to do is to uh, put an animal through a, a rescue to then euthanize it immediately afterwards and also of course very important for safety of the rescue crew. Uh, it makes no sense to uh, put anyone uh, in a rescue situation for an animal which actually uh, was non-viable right from the uh, start. Now for this talk we're not going to go through how these diseases look but uh, when we're doing vet training in the UK we've identified a, uh, an essential uh, injury checklist that we want vets to triage through when they're presented with um, large animals uh, and this is the list here so exhaustion with or without hypothermia muscle injuries, myopathies, uh, or other types of compression injury, hypoxia and circulatory compromise. This would usually result from animals being uh, on their side or upside down, whether that's in ditches uh, or after road traffic collisions. Uh, burns, uh, trauma to head and spine, uh, causing nervous system injury, 
uh, wounds and fractures. And what I will do in this talk is just say a few words about wounds and fractures, especially fractures, because there are some very important principles there that we all need to uh, be clear about. Now, irrespective of the injury, uh, every animal is going to need some sort of immediate care and stabilization before we transport it. Now, this could be a very simple matter of just allowing animal time to rest and perhaps uh, giving it some warmth, putting some blankets on or whatever. Uh, but we also include some more veterinary interventions like giving pain relief, possibly intravenous fluids, if there's wounds present, cleaning them and putting dressings on, and maybe even giving uh, antibiotics and anti-tetanus before transport off for treatment. Once you've stabilized the uh, casualty though, many casualties do not require emergency transport, nor do they require special transport measures. Having said that though, accurate triage and prompt decision making is vital because we must uh, make sure we can identify the animals uh, which are viable against those which are not, not viable. Make sure that uh, we quickly identify those animals that do need emergency transport. This is the minority, but we need to make sure we correctly identify those. And also identify those injuries where special transport considerations are required. The last thing we want to do is get the animal on the truck and send it off to uh, another centre for treatment, only to find that the act of transporting has made its injuries much worse and converted a seriously injured animal into a non-viable one that needs euthanasia. And I'll show you some examples of where that's gone wrong a little later in the talk. Now, I, th I think a useful way of uh, visualizing the decision-making pr process for triaging injuries is in a grid like this. And on the vertical axis here, we've got the appearance of the wound from uh, not dramatic through to dramatic, so doesn't look so bad through to looks pretty scary. And then on the horizontal here, the actual seriousness of, seriousness of the wound. So not very serious to very serious. Now, if we start with wounds which, uh, uh, sorry, start with injuries which look dramatic, they look bad, but actually are not very serious. Most wounds would fall into this category. Actually, most cases of blood loss, uh, large animals have a huge amount of blood in them, and a bit of blood goes a long way at an instant, and uh, fatal hemorrhage is actually fairly unusual, and uh, relatively small areas of burns would be in this category too. If we move to this uh, section here, this would be uh, wounds which look bad and actually are bad. Uh, this would be some fractures, but note it's not all fractures. Some wounds, severe cases with exhaustion, muscle injury, and hypothermia. Uh, many examples of brain and spine trauma, and animals with large areas of burns would all be uh, in that category. And then we've got wounds which actually don't look very bad but are really serious. Uh, some fractures would fall into this category. Puncture wounds into joints and uh, tendon sheaths, and these really often don't look very serious at all. They may just be a barbed wire spike that's gone through the skin, for example. Uh, punctures into body cavities and some examples of head trauma. And then finally, uh, wounds which actually don't look very dramatic and are genuinely not very serious. Some wounds would be in this category, mild cases of exhaustion, hypothermia, uh, mild muscle injuries and animals which have been on their side or upside down for a short time and have experienced transient hypoxia uh, and circulatory compromise. So that's a kind of logical uh, uh, framework to think about injuries in. We can then translate this directly into decision making for transport. And this is really where this all comes together. So here's that same grid with how bad the injury looks and actually how serious it truly is. So the same grid as before. But this is now helping us make decisions on whether this animal needs emergency transport or not. So if we start back up at this top corner again with the things that look bad but actually are not that serious, well, these animals need immediate care and then when they're ready, to be moved on by emergency transport, but there's plenty of time to get this sorted out. 
the dramatic wounds which actually are serious, these become a priority casualty. These animals need immediate care, so stabilization, followed by emergency transport, and generally this will need to have vet care uh, provision en route. So that's going to affect the type of transport that we're going to consider using. And then the wounds which don't look very bad but actually are serious, again, these are a priority casualty. Uh, they're going to need immediate care and stabilization followed by emergency transport, but probably the need for vet care en route is not required with this uh, type of injury. And then finally, these uh, not very dramatic looking wounds, which actually are not very serious. And this would be the large majority of animals which have been in entrapments or in incidents involving the emergency s services. And for this group, emergency transport is not required. Transport away from the incident probably will be needed, uh, but it doesn't need to be arranged as an emergency. So I hope that gives you a sense of uh, the triage decision-making pr process to decide whether the case uh, needs to be uh, emergency transport away from the incident uh, or not. So I'll say a few words about wounds and fractures now, because I think there's some really important points about these. And for all of those of you who've been involved with instance with animals with wounds, you'll know that many wounds really do appear quite dramatic, but actually most of these, fortunately, are not, are not serious. Um, as I mentioned before, blood loss may appear to be significant, but actually in large animals is rarely life-threatening, unless the animal's been really unlucky, unlucky and has cut a major artery, and we've got sustained arterial bleeding from the wound, but that's fairly unusual. But on the flip side, there are some wounds which appear completely innocuous, but actually are life-threatening. And this would be these small puncture wounds that go through into vital structures like joints, tendon sheaths, body cavities. And it's critical that those are identified and the animal is moved on uh, as an emergency for treatment uh, at a specialist center or a, um, a clinic which is capable of doing that kind of work. Now, most wounds do not need special transport considerations uh, once the patient has been stabilized. But I'll show you some examples in a few slides' time where wounds um, do need to have special uh, transport measures to safeguard the uh, health of the animal. And just as an overview, immediate care for wounds would include things like uh, cleaning the wound up, possibly lavaging it out with water, and maybe putting a, a dressing of some sort of bandage on to uh, stabilize the wound and to keep it clean. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, perhaps antibiotics and anti-tetanus and maybe IV fluids, but uh, this would generally not be essential for most animals with wounds. So let's look at these two here. We've got uh, a pretty dramatic looking injury here. This is a horse that's uh, been uh, in a, a horse truck, it's panicked uh, uh, whilst in the lorry, it's got uh, hooked up over a partition and has shredded its back leg um, whilst it's been trapped. This is another horse that's been in an entrapment, uh, it's been uh, stuck in a bog in a field and at some point during the uh, during animals thrashing around it's cut into itself on its pastern. Uh, with its um, hind foot. So I think worth just pausing to think which of these is the more serious and which of these would need emergency transport. Tempting to think it's this one here, in actual fact it's this one. Here's that wound cleaned up, really looks like nothing much at all, but in fact this uh, cut has gone through the skin and has severed one of the tendons on this side of the leg and this horse was correctly triaged and referred appropriately as an emergency. Here it is in the hospital uh, in theatre having a really major repair to the structures in that uh, pastern area and I think you wouldn't necessarily have thought that that was such a big deal when you were just presented with that. How about these two? This is a uh, riding horse. It's been hit from behind by a car 
and has a pretty significant looking injury to its rump. This is a horse which has um, freaked out again in a horse lorry. It's gone over the partition and in the process of flashing around has ripped open its flank. Both these look pretty serious. In actual fact, this one is not such a big deal and uh, was repaired and made a quick recovery. This horse actually uh, was not appropriately triaged. It was uh, put on a transporter and referred in like this as an emergency. There is almost nothing holding this horse's abdomen uh, uh, together. The body wall is completely ripped open and there's precious little holding all of its um, uh, guts and viscera in, in place. This is that horse after repair and this is the kind of um, wound support bandage which is a really good idea to put on animals before emergency transport uh, in order to, to stabilize wounds uh, along the uh, ventral abdomen, along the belly. And this is a, a commercial belly band, it's a velcro and elastic but yeah, very easy to put on and a really good piece of kit for uh, animals with extensive uh, wounds to the chest or to the, or to the abdomen. How about these two? These are again two horses that have both been in uh, road traffic uh, instance. This is the horse that um, somehow got underneath the partition in the lorry it was being transported in and has thrashed and thrashed and thrashed. It's got extensive trauma along its head and along its body and legs. Uh, its head is in quite a mess. And you can see these abrasions and how swollen the eye is. Here's a second horse which has been in a trailer accident and in the process of the trailer going over this horse has also experienced head trauma. So which of these um, which of these uh, requires emergency tr transport? Well actually this horse on the left is okay but this horse on the right really has experienced a significant injury even though it looks just like this one. In fact, it, this animal has ruptured its eyeball, it's got extensive head fractures, it's got a brain injury, and this is the CT, these are transverse x-rays of this horse's head. Uh, we'll maybe just look at this one here. This is the normal eye. Uh, these are its teeth and its jaw. This is its tongue, this is its airway. These air spaces here is in black are its sinuses, and here's the brain uh, on the horse's left side, the uninjured side. Look what's happened on the injured side. The eye is completely ruptured. This white area here is the bone that forms the orbit. That's completely smashed in on this side. And look what's happened to the bone of the sinuses. Again, completely smashed. And this fracture here is extended through into the uh, cranium where the brain is. And look how different the appearance of the brain there is compared to this side. And I think if I just go back to the picture of the horse, you wouldn't necessarily have picked up that these, in these injuries had happened. But this horse was correctly triaged, triaged and was correctly referred in uh, for emergency tra tra transport. Um, just show you one other image this horse. This is a three-dimensional reconstruction of this horse's head. I'll play the video clip in a second. This is the damaged side. Uh, just look at how smart this skull is. Look at the damage here. You wouldn't, I think, have picked that up. This is the normal side, the uninjured side. And as this comes round, it turns out that the person who triaged this was doing a terrific job because this horse also has a fracture through the base of its skull. And I'll just play the video. There's a line you'll see through here. This horse is very lucky. Can you see that fracture running through there? So the base of its skull is fractured in addition to all of this, this damage here. So a good example of where triage is important and a good example of uh, injuries that perhaps don't look quite as severe uh, as they actually are.
I couldn't resist showing that clip. The seat is our favourite toy. Okay, so uh, on to fractures and a few words about those. Now, horses will not tolerate a flail limb. In other, in other words, a limb like this where the fracture uh, makes the limb unable to bear weight. Uh, when this happens, uh, the horse panics. This is all part of their flight uh, response. This makes them very difficult to handle. It also greatly increases the risk of further injury to the limb and, of course, increases the risk of injury to people. Um, you might recognize this horse. This is Barbaro. Um, this is the photograph from 2006. Barbaro at the time was America's greatest flat racing horse. He'd won the Kentucky Derby at the beginning of 2006. And this is him in the next race en route they hoped winning the Triple Crown. Coming out the starting gate he had a catastrophic fracture of his uh, left hind limb and you can see this is a good example of a flail. The bottom of that leg is just flailing around and is useless. This horse will not settle and is panicking uh, because of that, that fracture. Um, immobilizing that, putting some sort of support on it, provides immediate comfort and horses will settle down even though they've still got the pain of the presence. And this greatly increases safety of the people working around the horse and obviously also increases the welfare for the horse. So if we're presented with fractures, uh, there are some considerations which are critical before emergency transport. Uh, firstly, the limb must be stabilized before the horse is tra transported. And that's important for uh, the reasons I've just said. It reduces anxiety, increases safety, and reduces the risk of damage to other structures in the leg, like muscles and blood vessels and nerves and so on. And getting that immediate care is really important with, with fractures. If we get it wrong, then we're going to seriously compromise any chance of repairing that, that injury. And just to reassure you, if we put correct immobilization on the leg, this is not going to encourage excessive weight bearing. It will just allow the horse to stand on the limb so it can be properly loaded, transported, and then offloaded again. And perhaps the most important message here is do not attempt to transport a fracture unless it's been correctly immobilized. Now the principles of um, immediate care and mobilization of fractures are really quite straightforward. For fractures at the bottom of the leg, uh, there's, there's a really good commercial splint system. Uh, this is an aluminium uh, strip with Velcro um, straps on it. It's a Kimsey leg saver splint, uh, very easy to apply. For fractures in the top of the leg, we need to improvise a bit and use a combination of homemade splints with a long splint to extend up the leg, uh, and this is a skill that um, uh, vets attending uh, incidents like this need to be very good at doing. Or we may need to put a full leg bandage on uh, like this. There's a variety of things that we can use uh, to stabilize fractures ahead of being tran transported. Uh, so we don't need lots of materials here. Uh, vets trucks should all have these on board. So dealing with a distal leg fracture like this, a uh, Kimsey leg, leg splint saver like this is a brilliant way of stabilizing those. We need materials to make homemade splints, so uh, lengths of timber, um, plastic guttering, uh, tape and bandages, and really with a very simple selection of uh, kit in the emergency box, we can stabilize uh, most fractures and make them safe for transport. And there's a lot of information freely available on splinting techniques for stabilizing fractures. I, I particularly like the information uh, from the American Association of Equine Practitioners, AAEP. Uh, there's a really good uh, PDF download available from there. And if you're interested in this, do visit the AAP website and download it. It's a really good resource with full, lots of practical tips on how to manage fra fractures for transport. Which brings us to transporting fra fracture cases and uh, a couple of very important points. 
uh, very obviously, perhaps, but bring the transport to the horse rather than the horse to the transport. We want to minimize walking of the casualty. And then we need to think about the direction we're going to travel the horse in. And if the uh, vehicle will allow us to, if it's, if it's got the configuration to allow this, then ideally we'd transport animals with four limb fractures facing backwards and transport animals with hind limb fractures facing forwards. The idea being that uh, weight will be transferred onto the sound limbs when the vehicle you know, slows down and stops. Now there are some definite transport challenges I think. The recumbent or collapsed animal is very difficult because it's often not very clear what the cause of the recumbency or collapse is and also what the prognosis is. And uh, I think best practice is generally to transport them away as an emergency uh, so that they can be properly investigated, diagnosed and treated uh, away from the incident. And this means that we need to be ready to transport using a rescue glide and also to transport under general anesthesia. So obviously require veterinary attendants whilst tra transporting. And I think there's a particular challenge with upper limb fractures because uh, although the horse may be lame, it may not be at all obvious that this animal has an upper limb, limb, limb fracture. And I'll show an example of where that went badly wrong in just a second. And also horses which are uncoordinated, horses with brain and spine trauma, uh, are really difficult to, to transport because they're so unsteady on their feet. So a couple of think before you transport examples. This is a, a trotting horse. It uh, was found down and apparently stuck, uh, unable to rise in the field. Uh, emergency services were called to do an assisted lift. Uh, the animal would not stand. Uh, it was manhandled into the back of a lorry, transported to our hospital. It turns out it had not been triaged properly. This animal has laminitis. This is an x-ray of the bottom of its leg. Uh, its hoof is just here. And actually, had the hoofs been inspected, uh, the vet would have found that the tip of the pedal bone here was sticking out through the bottom of the sole. This happened on two feet. This is a non-viable animal and should have been euthanized before it was tran transported. And this is an x-ray of the stifle, so uh, of the hind limb of a yearling warm blood which had been stuck in a gate and had been uh, released by the fire and rescue service, had not been properly triaged by the attending vets and was transported to our, our clinic. This is its stifle. Uh, this is the tibia here. This is the kneecap. This is the bottom end of the femur. Here is the shaft of the femur. This should be attached onto there. This is a catastrophic fracture, which was probably non-displaced before transport and has become displaced during transport because the leg wasn't stabilized. In other words, transporting this animal converted a serious injury into a fatal injury. I'm just going to finish up with a few words about transported uh, uh, design. And Luckily, most uh, horses can be transported in just regular horse trailers and lorries once they've been rescued. Generally, we don't need special vehicles. But there are some disadvantages of regular trailers and regular lorries. They generally have quite steep access ramps. Generally, it's not possible to turn horses round in the uh, trailer or, or the truck before offloading. Uh, there's usually not a uh, real provision to support the horse whilst they're traveling. Uh, there's no safe place for accompanying personnel in the vehicle. And the horse may only be able to travel either facing forwards or backwards. So we may not be able to arrange a fractured patient in the way that we'd like. And some horses do have special transport needs, which regular trailers and lorries will uh, not be able to uh, deal with. In particular, horses which are down, uh, so they're recumbent or collapsed, animals which are uncoordinated, and many animals with fractures, especially uh, with upper limb fractures. So in the UK, uh, there's a, the, this type of arrangement will be very common at uh, races and competitions. It's a regular twin axle uh, two horse trailer, perfectly good for most jobs. Uh, and horse trucks like this are also 
perfectly good for most emergency uh, tra transports. However, sometimes dedicated horse ambulances are a very good idea. This is an example of uh, a, a custom-made ambulance uh, from the US, it, it's made by the same company that made those leg splints. In the next slides I'll show you a vehicle that we had made uh, for the uh, 2012 Olympics. But a dedicated horse ambulance should be low loading, uh, have more internal space than a regular vehicle, be able to be configured flexibly, ideally so we can turn the horse round. The ramps and flooring should allow easy movement of an Indian horse, so no steps or ridges. The sidewalls should be adjustable to provide support. Ideally, we'd like space to sling a horse in. There should be space to have a, a down horse, a recumbent horse on a glide, ability to hang IV fluids, and a safe travel area for accompanying personnel. And this is the vehicle that uh, we had for the Olympics, and this meets all of these criteria. Um, it's got a side ramp and a rear ramp, so it can load either way. The ramp is very long and has a very gradual incline. There are no steps, no ridges for the horse to trip over. On the inside, the horse area, this is essentially a pair of stocks on a turntable. The sides of the stocks can be adjusted for width to provide more or less support for the horse as required. We can hang fluids and other equipment from the uh, sides. All of this can be taken out to fit a horse on a rescue glide in. We've got safe areas for people to travel and a countertop area here for putting equipment and uh, other veterinary items on. Not many of these vehicles exist, but they do set the standard for where uh, large animal emergency transports should be headed. Just a word about um, large-scale road traffic collisions with large animals. Um, Jim may well have talked about this already. Um, I think there's no doubt that uh, these incidents do present a significant challenge to everybody. Uh, I think there are particular issues, for example, getting safe access inside the damaged vehicle. It's very difficult to organize rapid and efficient triage. It's a real challenge to provide adequate immediate care when you've got large numbers of injured animals. It can also be difficult to efficiently euthanize those non-viable animals as well. Generally, there's a lack of uh, trained and experienced personnel. And finding a safe area to corral animals uh, once they've been extracted before they're reloaded uh, can also be very difficult. So this sort of scene, this is an instant Jim was involved with a uh, articulated lorry with a number of polo ponies in the back. Very difficult uh, scene to manage, very difficult to manage that transport away afterwards. And uh, instant, like the one at the top with a pig uh, transporter that's gone over and the one underneath with a cattle truck transporter, again, uh, very challenging to work with. So uh, that's my last slide. Here's um, uh, rush to make critical decisions. If you doubt transport, don't euthanize. Remember, not all dramatic injuries are serious, but equally, some apparently non dramatic injuries can be very serious indeed. Uh, take your time, stabilize, and only transport the animal when it's fit to do so. Make sure the vehicle's suitable, the destination knows the animal is coming, and everyone knows what to do. And above all else, never compromise animal welfare or personnel's safety. So thank you very much for um, listening to this talk and thank you very much again for the invitation to speak to you and if you have any time I'd be very pleased to uh, take any questions. So Chairman, Chris, Jim, thank you both very much. Thank you.